بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so we continue on insha'Allah ta'ala with our aim of at least three pages of Bulugh al-Maram so that we can get to the end of Kitab al-Tahara before the onset of the month of Ramadan insha'Allah ta'ala so we're on to hadith number 114 وَعَنْ عَائِشَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا أَنَّهَا قَالَتْ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِذَا اغْتَسَلَ مِنَ الْجَنَابَةِ يَبْدَأُ فَيَغْسِلُ يَدَيْهِ ثم يفرغ بيمينه على شماله فيغسل فرجه ثم يتوضا ثم ياخذ الماء فيدخل اصابعه في اصول الشعر ثم حفن على راسه ثلاث هف ثلاث حفنات ثم افاض على سائر جسده ثم غسل رجلي متفق عليه واللفظ لمسلم and in hadith number 115, وَلَهُمَا فِي حَدِيثِ مَيْمُونَ ثُمَّ أَفْرَغَ عَلَى فَرْجِهِ وَغَسَلَهُ وَغَسَلَهُ بِشِمَالِهِ ثُمَّ ضَرَبَ بِهَا الْأَرْضِ وَفِي رواية فَمَسَحَهَا بِالتُرَابِ وَفِي آخِرِهِ ثُمَّ أَتَيْتُهُ بِمِنْدِيلٍ فَرَدَّهُ وَفِيهِ وَجَعَلَ يَنْفُضُ الْمَاءَ بِيَدِهِ so hadith number 114 from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that she said the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he would make ghusl from janaba so he is making ghusl because he is in the state of janaba he would begin by washing his hands he would begin by washing his hands much like we begin our wudu by washing our hands as an introduction to the as an introduction to the to the act of tahara and i think we mentioned when we talked about wudu that one of the reasons for this is you don't really want to be putting dirty hands into uh, a clean vessel and then making the water dirty and likewise you don't want to be cleaning yourself when your hands are dirty in the first place so you want to be making sure that your your hands are clean so he would clean his hands. Then he would use his right hand to pour over his left and wash his private parts. So he would use his right hand to pour over his left. So the right hand is doing the, the pouring. And as we know, you know, people they didn't have showers, they didn't have, you know, bathtubs. They used to have a container, either a leather pouch or something similar or a bucket, and they used to you know, use that to wash themselves. So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would pick up the vessel with his right hand, pour the water over his left hand, and use his left hand to clean the area of his private parts. And that's because we know that when we clean our private parts, we do so with our left hand. And so the right hand pours the water and the left hand does the, the cleaning. The right hand pours, pours the water and the left hand does the cleaning. And this is actually an interesting principle it leads us to. And that is the principle of being free of impurities before beginning uh, the act of purification. So you, as you can imagine, there, there may be some impurities, especially if a person has been intimate with his wife, there may be some impurities in that region. And so it makes sense to wash that place first, because that is the place where there is likely to be some impurities before you make wudu. If you were to make wudu before washing your private parts, then the problem would be that there could well be some impurities on the body. And as we know, one of the conditions of wudu is that you have to remove all of the impurities from the body before you start. So cleaning that area with his left hand and using his right hand to pour the water. Then he would make wudu. In some narrations it mentions he would make wudu the wudu for the prayer. Any wudu ahu salah the wudu that he would make for the prayer. And as we know the wudu would make for the prayer, starting with the hands and then the mouth and the nose three times and the face three times and the then the you know the arms 
uh, and then wiping over the head and the ears and then again washing the feet. We'll come to the feet in a moment. But he would make the wudu that he would make for the prayer. The regular wudu that he would make for the prayer. And uh, the scholars have some different uh, opinions as to why this is that he would uh, that he would um, uh, that he would make wudu for the prayer and uh, basically or, or one of the ones that we can take from it is this opinion of the, these parts of the body being the most noble they have the most sharaf they have the most honor and we've heard the hadith of the ummah coming yom al qiyamah the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu an ghurran muhajjalin with the marks on their forehead and the marks on their on their limbs from the effect of the of the wudu so there's no doubt that the most honorable parts of a person are those parts that are washed in the wudu and they are the same parts that are primarily involved in the prayer you know your hands your forehead touching the ground in prostration you know so at the end of the day these are the most noble parts of the body and so they are more deserving of being washed first of all uh, as we said the cleaning of the private parts is essentially istinja it's essentially an act of cleaning yourself uh, after some uh, najasat uh, and one point uh, which is worth mentioning here uh, is that a, a misconception that people have and that is that there the reason for istinja and we didn't mention this in bab uh, qada al haja but it's worth i made a note of it to mention now to you which is that there is no istinja for breaking wind and istinja for breaking wind is a bid'ah and istinja if you break wind is a bid'ah so it's not allowed for a person to make istinja for only breaking wind but as for any other fluid passing out or substance passing out from the front or back passage then istinja is required so when a person is intimate and they have some fluid uh, around their private area then there's no doubt that this requires al-istinja even though we said that semen is tahir according to the stronger opinion among the scholars at the end of the day there are other substances at the time there are substances from uh, you know the the female there are substances there in terms of uh, al-madhi which is the pre-ejaculate which is which needs to be washed with istinja so there is no doubt whatsoever about the need of istinja of, of cleaning yourself uh, before making this wudu and like we said the scholars mostly mentioned that the reason for it is that making wudu first is because you want to give pref preference and precedence to those parts of the body in the ghusl that these are the most important most important parts of my body when I am making ghusl then it's mentioned that he would take the water and he would he would take a handful of water and he would take his hands and put his hands into the base of his hair so it's kind of like you know taking your hands and putting it into into the base of where your hair is and getting getting like rubbing your scalp into the base of you know the base of where your hair is and that is something that the prophet sallallahu would do because he had very thick hair and when you have thick hair, it's recommended for you to put your hands inside and to massage your scalp, like to get water into the scalp. Because the water in ghusl, one of the conditions of ghusl, is that the water needs to touch every single part of the body. And so if you were to just pour water over your head, it may well be that the water doesn't touch every part of your body. And so what you need to do, especially if you have thick hair, although you don't, it's not only for people with thick hair, but especially if you have thick hair, then you need to take your fingers and you need to sort of pour water over your head and massage the water into the root, the roots of the hair. After that, it's mentioned that he would pour over his head three handfuls of water. So that's a handful over the head and then another handful over the head and then another handful over the head that's three times the handfuls of water over the head as for the number three many of the scholars said that this number three is a recommendation and the evidence for this is that it's sufficient in ghusl to cover your body in water from top to bottom 
So the number three here is a, a recommendation. It's a sunnah. It's like three times in wudu. The Prophet ﷺ made wudu marratan marra, one time each. And he made wudu marrataini marratain, two times followed by two times. And he made wudu the complete way of washing each part with the three times except for the head and the ears. So likewise here, you can pour three times over your head or twice over your head or once over your head. But the sunnah is three times, three uh, handfuls poured over, over the head three hafanat and in some uh, narrations three hafayat hafanat and hafayat and handfuls of a full handful of, of of water poured over the head it's also mentioned or at least some of the scholars extracted from this preferring the right side over the left side even in this even when washing the hair that when you start pouring the water over you pour it over the over the right side first and then you go over to your left hand side and you know so on and so forth or like you know rubbing the right side before the left because the Prophet ﷺ used to prefer the right hand side over the left in all of his matters of purification as we have heard then he would pour the water over the rest of his body and there's an important note here which something I didn't know until I studied this again which is the word sa'ir and the word sa'ir does not include the parts that have already been washed and what that means is when you pour the water over the rest of your body you don't need to pour it over your arms up to your elbows you don't need to pour it over your face you don't need to pour it over your hair you don't need to pour it over your feet you only need to pour the water over the parts of the body that have not been washed up to that point so what have you washed you've washed your hands You've then washed your face in full. You've washed your arms up to the elbows in full. You've washed your head as part of the, uh, as part of the washing of the hair. And you washed your feet. So those parts do not need to be poured the water over them again. If the water goes on them, it's not a big deal, but that's not your intention. So if you had the shower head or whatever you're using or the jug that you're pouring the water with you don't need after you've washed your hair to pour water over your head and your arms and your hands you only need to pour water over the back the shoulders under the arms the upper arm then the waist making sure that the water gets into the places where it's likely to be forgotten so places water like might not reach which you have to be very careful of especially in the shower is be careful about uh, under the arms be careful about the belly button be careful about the arch of the foot and the heel you know the part under the foot because when you're in the shower you can quite easily come out of the shower and no water has gone under your arms or no water has gone into your belly button or no water has gone under the arc of your foot because it's been protected by the rest of the body so when you are washing the rest of the body it means the full body which means you must lift up your arm and wipe under your arms you must wipe inside of your belly button you must wipe the base of your foot and make sure that the water has gone everywhere but the key meaning is sa'ir here and uh, Sheikh Khazan noted this and he said Habibullah, that uh, the mistake that people make is they think that sa'ir means all but it doesn't in Arabic the word sa'ir means the rest of the body i.e. what hasn't been washed up to that point then he would wash his feet then he would wash his feet and there are two opinions regarding the washing of the feet one opinion is that you delay washing your feet you don't wash them in wudu and you wash your feet at the end of the ghusl and the description of this is that you step away from the place you've been making ghusl you step away from that place and you wash your feet in a new place and the reason for doing that is that when you've been making ghusl all of the water that's been coming off of the body and you know everything has been congealing around your feet and especially that they used to make wudu on the you know on the sand and on the dirt and so your feet would be all covered in you know bits of sand bits from your body and so what you would do is you would do everything except your feet then you would step away from the big puddle of water that you've left and then wash your feet separately with clean water to complete the ghusl. And even if you're making wudu in the shower 
that's still somewhat valid. You know, you still get a collection of water around your feet. It's not as bad as when you're doing it on the sand, but you still get a collection of water around your feet. So there's no harm in taking a step away from where you've been washing your feet and then washing your feet somewhere uh, like separately. For example, stepping out of the shower cubicle and then putting your feet over the edge and, and washing your feet or stepping out of the bath and putting your feet over the edge and washing your feet, something like that. So one opinion is that you leave washing the feet from wudu, you don't wash them at the time of wudu, and you wash them at the time of the end of the ghusl. And that's okay, and we know that's okay because we know the principle with regard to al-mu'ala in wudu, continuity in wudu, is as long as the part of the body is still wet that you washed prior to that, you can, you can delay your washing your feet. There's nothing that breaks your wudu. For example, if I make wudu of everything except my feet, and then I stay in the shower for five minutes and then I wash my feet, I'm still wet. So there's no, there's no issue with delaying it. However, Shaykh Hazan Havidullah, he said that the better way of doing it is to wash your feet twice. One time when you make wudu, and then when you step away from the area that you've made ghusl in, you wash your feet again. You wash your feet again. And subhanAllah, this, you know, subhanAllah, it has so many benefits to it. Uh, one of those is that generally accompanied by ghusl, people tend to cut their hair, their body hair. People tend to, uh, you know, sort of have other things. And all of these things kind of congeal around your, your feet. So taking a step away from the, the place where you've made ghusl and washing your feet at the end is something beneficial. And if you suffice yourself with only washing it at the time of wudu, this is fine. And if you suffice yourself with only washing it at the end and you don't wash it at the time of wudu, then that is also fine. But it seems to me that based on this hadith that he would make his wudu for the prayer, notice that the hadith doesn't say he would miss out his feet. It says he would make his wudu for the prayer and his wudu for the prayer would include his, his feet. So it seems to me that this hadith indicates that we wash our feet twice. One time with the wudu, and then we step away from the area where we've made ghusl, and we wash our feet uh, again. Uh, again, one other issue that is worth mentioning is uh, this hadith does not mention whether or not the Prophet ﷺ washed his body three times or one time. Uh, if we remember the hadith, it mentions washing the private parts, it mentions washing, making the wudu, it mentions three times the head, but it doesn't mention whether the body was washed three times or not. It doesn't say once and it doesn't say three times. Some of the scholars said that the correct opinion is that it is better for you to wash the body three times and it's acceptable for you to wash it once. And they said, Qiyasan. Al-wudu, it's a qiyas, it's an analogy with wudu. Because at the end of the day in wudu, you wash everything three times except for the wiping over your head and the ears. And likewise, in the ghusl, there is no harm in you washing the body three times also. And Allah Jalla knows best. Someone might ask the question, uh, a couple of questions. First of all, is it necessary to do ghusl like this? Is it necessary to wash the hands and the private parts and then make the wudu and then, you know, and then the head three times and then wash the rest of the body and then wash the feet? The answer is no. It is sufficient for you to cover your body from the top of the head to the tip of the toe in water with the intention of removing the ghusl. However, the complete way and the best way and the way that gives you the wudu for the prayer is if you were to make it in this way. And there is a disagreement among the scholars about whether if you jump in a swimming pool you can get wudu out of it or not. But there's no doubt that if you do it this way, which is the way according to the sunnah, then what is going to happen is you have wudu and you have made ghusl, wudu and ghusl together. So you can go out and you can, you can uh, pray immediately after that. Someone might also ask the question, why do we have to cover the entire body in water? Why is it not sufficient to wash the private parts and make wudu? Why do we need to wash our hair? Why do we need to wash our legs? Why do we need to wash our shoulders? Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the, the people to mention this, he said, the entire body has a, a pleasure 
from intimacy. And that is a pleasure that is felt in the entire body. Every part of the body benefits from that. And therefore, when every part of the body feels that sort of uh, that pleasure, then likewise, every part of the body should be washed with water. That is the reason that Ibn al-Qayyim and others, rahimahumullah ta'ala, gave this, uh, this example. In hadith number 115, we have a similar discussion of the ghusl of the Prophet Sallallahu this time from Maymuna radiallahu anha. And she says in it, then he poured water over his private parts and washed it with his left hand. That is similar. That is, uh, that is similar to the hadith of Aisha. He poured water over his private parts with his right hand and washed it with his left hand. Uh, in the hadith of Aisha, he poured water over his left hand and then washed his private parts, but the two are the same thing. Then he struck the ground with his hands. He struck the ground with his hands. The scholars say the reason for striking the, the ground with his, uh, with his hands is to increase in removing um, impurities that might have, you know, after you have sort of, uh, you know, touched your private parts, then, you know, presumably you would want to be even more sort of clear that you have got rid of all of the impurities and things that might stick on your hands and might not be, might not be clean. Bearing in mind, it's not a power shower, you know, it's not like, it's not like a jet stream that's washing the hand. It's a little bit of water from a, a jug. So he struck the ground with his, his hand in order to you know, get rid of anything that had attached itself to his hands before washing his hand. And in a wording, he wiped over his hand with dust. And that is the same thing, whether he struck the ground or whether he took the dust and rubbed it over his hand, this is an extra way of getting clean. It's not something that's required for you to do, but if you feel that you need to uh, wash your hands with soap after you've cleaned your private parts or you feel that you need to wash them with dust, or dirt or you need to you know wipe them with a towel or something like that then there's no harm in any of these things all of these things are allowed and then we come to the end of the hadith I came to him with a mindil and the word mindil here is a piece of cloth uh, I know that they tend to use mindil for a tissue these days but the word for a mindil or the mindil in, in classical Arabic means a piece of cloth like a like a piece of cloth that you might dry yourself with. They didn't have towels as such, but like, you know, a piece of material that you might use as a towel or you might use as a handkerchief. That is a mindil, it's a piece of cloth. And uh, Maymuna, radiallahu uh, anha, she brought a piece of cloth to the Prophet for him to dry himself with, and he refused it. He referred that, and he gave it back. He, he didn't accept it. And in this narration it says, وَجَعَلَ يَمْفُضُ الْمَاءَ بِيَدِهِ And he began to brush the water off with his hands. He began to brush the water off with his hands. So we have to understand first of all what the hadith is telling us. It's telling us that Maymuna came to him with the equivalent of a towel. So she's serving her husband, radiallahu ta'ala anha, by you know bringing him a towel after he comes out of the sh out of the bath of course it's not a towel like the towels we have uh, today but it's a piece of material to dry himself with and the prophet sallam does not accept it faraddahu seems to indicate that he, he when she gave it to him he he gave it back to her and he began to to brush off the water with his hand like the excess water he began to brush the water off with his his hand In one of the narrations, فَلَمْ يُرِدْهَا He did not want to use it. فَلَمْ يُرِدْهَا He didn't want to use it. The scholars, or some of the scholars, extracted from this. The, they tried to understand the reason why the Prophet ﷺ didn't ask for a towel. First of all, there's nothing wrong with using a towel. There's nothing haram about using a towel. But they differed over why he didn't use a towel. And many of them said the reason is that this water 
is the effect or the after effect of an ibadah that you've done, an act of worship to Allah. And so you shouldn't be so quick to remove the effects of that act of worship from you. And that it is better that you don't dry yourself thoroughly after wudu and ghusl, but that you simply just, you know, shake off the excess water. You know, you just either you take your hand and just brush off, or you, you know, you shake your hands to, to get the excess water off, and you don't dry yourself properly. And they said that the reason for this is that wudu and ghusl are one of the great forms of ibadah that you do. They're attached to the prayer. And you shouldn't be so quick to remove the effect of that worship by, you know, removing its effect completely with a towel until you are dry. As we said, there is no issue whatsoever and there is no ikhtilaf that it is permissible to dry yourself after wudu. And some of the scholars did not take this opinion at all and they simply said that, you know, there is, you, there is no virtue over drying yourself and not drying yourself. But many of the scholars and from them our Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Fawzan, Hamidullah, when we are explaining this Bulugh uh, al-Maram from, he said that the best thing for you to do, the recommended thing, is that you don't dry yourself thoroughly when you come from ghusl, or you don't dry yourself thoroughly when you make wudu, but all you do is just shake off the excess water or just brush off, you know, just brush yourself with your hand and just shake off the excess water. And then you, you know, you're still a little bit damp because this is the effect of the worship that you did to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you don't go ahead to remove it uh, so quickly. I think that concludes most of the important points in this particular uh, hadith. So we continue to our next hadith, insha'Allah ta'ala, which is hadith number 116. وَعَنْ سَلَمَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا أَنَّهَا قَالَتْ قُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنِّي مْرَأَةٌ أَشُدُّ شَعْرَ رَأْسِي أَفَأَنْخُضُهُ لِغُسْلِ الْجَنَابَةِ وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ الْحَيْضَةِ فَقَالَ لَا إِنَّمَا يَكْفِيكِ أَنْ أن تَحْذِي عَلَى رَأْسِكِ ثَلَاثَ حَثَيَاتِ رَوَاهُ مسلم. This hadith is from Um Salama. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but as we're going through these ahadith, how many of these ahadith about ghusl are narrated from the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen? رضي الله تعالى عنهن وأرضاهن. What do you understand from that? You understand from that the importance of those women in the life of, of or in the passing of the Sunnah. Because the reality is there are so many things that we could never have known about the Prophet وسلم, except by what was transmitted to us from the Ummahat al mumini And no doubt at the, at the forefront of them, our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. The reality is that how much of this religion was brought to us by those women. And there's no doubt that, you know, the likes of Aisha, the likes of Um Salama, radiallahu anhuma, are, represent the senior, some of the senior scholars among the Sahaba. Aisha radiallahu anha is considered to be the fourth highest among all of the Sahaba in ifta, in the number of fatawa that she gave in the number of fatawa that she issued. She's the fourth highest in the number of hadith that she narrated. And nobody narrated more hadith than her than, except for three sahaba. And she is the fourth highest in the number of fatawa that she gave, approximately. I and mean, the number of times she gave a judgment on an issue. So it's no doubt that these, our mothers, the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, represent some of the major scholars in Islam and some of the people who were the most knowledgeable about this religion among the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and whom. And of course there were among them more knowledgeable than them but they were among the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba and certainly the likes of Aisha radiallahu anha, the likes of Salama said that among the, the major sources of fatwa among the Sahaba. And so this is something that we have to understand the virtue of those women and we have to understand the importance of them in transmitting the sunnah to us. Because there were so many private matters that could not have been known by the rest of the Sahaba to do with etiquettes of the bathroom, to do with etiquettes of intimacy, of ghusl, of uh, you know, other issues. So many of those are narrated by the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen. 
and you see here each one of them is narrating things that we could not have known except from them about how the Prophet ﷺ made ghusl and what kind of things that he used to do uh, and other sort of issues of sort of privacy and intimacy that we learned from them radiallahu ta'ala anhunna. So it's quite important that we, we understand that, that and we understand uh, the benefit of that and particularly the benefit of Aisha radiallahu anha and the fact that Aisha spent her entire adult life with the Prophet ﷺ from the moment that she became an adult all the way until the death of the Prophet ﷺ. and Aisha was with the Prophet ﷺ in his house learning from him uh, observing him seeing you know everything that he did in terms of how he was when he was in private how he was with his wives and so on and so forth and that plays an absolutely critical role in our understanding of Islam and this hadith is narrated by Umm Salama radiallahu anha that she said I said O Messenger of Allah indeed I am a woman who ties my hair uh, in some narrations it's mentioned ties the plates or the plaits of my hair uh, here's where we're going to get into accents and differences but we in England, in England we call them plaits yeah so basically tying the tying the hair if you take the hair into three pieces and then you wrap one piece over the other and one piece over the other until the hair becomes like a, a solid uh, piece or in this narration it doesn't mention the the plaits in the hair but what it mentions is it mentions that she used to tie up her hair so it may be that she tied her hair two or three times to make like a what we would call like a ponytail you know like a, a piece of the hair that comes at the back or a piece of the hair that comes at the side and it may be as some of the narrations mentioned uh, that she would tie the, uh, yani the, the plaits in her hair so she would make plaits, whether they were many or a few, it isn't mentioned. But then she would, uh, from that, she would tie them. And especially when it comes to plaiting the hair, this is something that takes quite a lot of time. And so she said, should I undo it in order to make ghusl from al janaba Should I undo it in order to make ghusl from janaba So she's asking the question that if I plait my hair and I tie my hair into bunches or into plaits, should I undo them and make my hair completely loose in order to make ghusl from janaba or not? And in another narration from menstruation. So the narrators differed. Is she talking about janaba or is she talking about menstruation? So he said no, meaning you do not have to undo it. It is enough for you to pour three handfuls over your head meaning that she can leave her hair tied in a braid and she can pour three times over uh, her head through the water three times over her head and she doesn't need to undo the undo the braid and this is narrated by al imam muslim uh, with regard to the braids there are a few things that we should mention uh, first of all uh, this hadith is a proof that there is no harm in a woman braiding her hair uh, whether that is small braids or whether that is thick braids or whether that is like what we would call like a ponytail like uh, just gathering the hair all together and tying it at the back or tying it on the side however many of the scholars prohibited tying it at the top and it's a matter of some contention it's a little bit of a, a difficult one because the hadith indicates the curse of Allah upon the woman who from her characteristics is that her hair or her head represents the hump of a camel i.e. she ties her hair up in a bun or in a bob so that the hair comes above her head and it looks like a camel's hump this hadith for me is problematic there are some issues because it's not clear whether this is the reason for the curse or whether the reason for the curse is the fact that the Prophet said that she is uh, that she is naked while she is clothed I and mean, she's wearing clothes but she is in fact naked and whether that refers to tight-fitting clothing or revealing clothing uh, or a hairstyle but there's no doubt that this should be avoided in especially to avoid the disagreement and especially to avoid any curse of Allah coming upon a woman that she should not tie her hair upwards i.e. such that it comes up like the hump of a camel rather she can tie the hair to the back and she can tie the hair to the side 
uh, but she should not tie the hair upwards so that it represents like the, the hump of a camel. And uh, like I said, for me the hadith is a little bit problematic to explain because there are a lot of descriptions of the woman mentioned in it and it's not clear which of them is the one that is bringing the curse. Is the, the hair, is the hair just a description of those women and the fact that the curse is coming because of their clothing or the curse is coming because of their hair independent of their clothing and at the end of the day it is certainly something that a woman should avoid. As for hairstyle, uh, our Sheikh Hafidhullah was very strongly of the opinion that a woman should not style her hair, she should not cut her hair and she should leave her hair to be, uh, she should leave her hair to be long and she shouldn't cut it, she shouldn't style it. Uh, but in my opinion, I don't think that there is any delil for this. And I think that the delil is, is very custom oriented. In other words, if you come from a culture where women don't cut their hair and where cutting their hair is considered to be resembling of the non-Muslims, um, and I, we're not talking to a crazy degree. We're not talking that she never cuts her hair in her life. This is like some sort of, you know, Hinduist, you know, type, you know, strange ritual. You know, this is not something that is known from the Muslims. But that she doesn't, like, have her hair cut shorter than, like, its full length. You know, she might tidy her hair, but she doesn't have it cut shorter than her, her full length. She just keeps taking, you know, like the tip of her finger off the end to keep it at a long length. The reality is that I don't think there is any delil for preventing a woman from this. Uh, the Sheikh he mentioned the hadith Man biqawmin fahuwa minhum Whoever resembles a people is one of them. But the reality is if we made this hadith applicable to every single aspect then it would be extremely difficult to apply this hadith. Because we would say everyone who doesn't wear a thawb like this is resembling the non-Muslims. And everyone who wears, you know, uh, like any or anyone who has any appearance like them is resembling the non-Muslims. And anyone who has their hair short is resembling the non-Muslims. This is ba'id. This is, in my opinion, not a strong, not a strong opinion to say, to be honest with you. I think that at the end of the day, this tashabbuh is religious, as Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said, that it refers to them in the religious clothing. So if I look at you, and by looking at you, I think that you are not a Muslim. You know, when I look at you, you look like you're not a Muslim, then there is no doubt that this is a tashabbuh bil kafir. This is resembling a kafir. If I look at you and you don't look like you are a Muslim, then there's no doubt that this is resembling the kafir. No doubt about it. Because if people look at you and they don't know whether to give you salam or not, there's no doubt this is resembling the kafir. And from this is that, you know, the shaving of the beard and so on and so forth. There's no doubt that this is resembling the kafir and it's resembling the women. Because like we said, the lion that doesn't have a mane is a lioness. So there's no doubt that shaving the beard is resembling a woman. There's no doubt that shaving the beard is resembling the non-Muslims. There's no doubt that when a person dresses like them and acts like them and introduces and says, Hi, my name is Mike. You know, there's no doubt that this, you know, at the end of the day, this is a tashabbuh bil kuffar. Because when you look at that person, you don't know to give them salam. Because there's nothing in their appearance that would indicate that they're a Muslim at all. Likewise, if they wear the religious clothing of the non-Muslims. So for example, if they wear the, 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 the dog collar of the Christian priest, or the skull cap of the Jew, or the turban of the Sikh, and so on and so forth, or the, or the, uh, the robe of a Buddhist monk, there's no doubt that this is tashabbuh bil kafir. This is resembling the non-Muslim. As for saying that every woman who has her hair cut shorter than the bottom of her back is resembling the kafir, then this is ba'id. This is laysa bil qawi. This is not a strong opinion at all, in my opinion. There's no delil for this whatsoever. Rather, this is coming from the culture of a people who don't know their women to do it. And you have to understand people's culture in this regard. If you are coming from a culture where no woman has ever styled her hair until fashion magazines came out, there's no doubt that you're going to say to people that this is resembling the kuffar because they know nothing else. As for the countries where it's normal for the women to style their hair, there's no harm in a woman styling her hair as long as she doesn't style it in such a way that when the other women see her, they believe that she's no longer, you know, she's not a Muslim. And this can be, this can be true. You know, there are certain hairstyles that are haram, no doubt. 
uh, from the hairstyles that are haram are those which are men's hairstyles. So a woman cutting her hair like a man. So making her hair very, very short or shaven like a man. There is no doubt that this is resembling the men. And the Prophet Sallallahu cursed the, the women that resemble men and the men that resemble women. And there's no doubt that there are certain hairstyles resembling non-Muslims, whether that's, you know, certain colors or certain styles or putting certain things in the hair, that when you look at the woman, that you would think she's not a, you would think she's not a Muslim. And that's not befitting. But the reality of this situation, to say that every woman who cuts two inches from her hair is resembling a kafir, I think this is not a strong opinion at all. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Having said that, there is something to be said for the culture and bearing in mind the norms of the culture you come from. So if you come from a culture where women are not expected to cut their hair short, then there's no doubt that in this case, the woman, it's better for her to refrain from cutting her hair short in this case, uh, especially if it's not expected or especially if it would displease her husband or it would lead people to say bad things about her. And there are some cultures in the world, especially some certain parts of India, Pakistan, etc., where if a woman cuts her hair short, she gets uh, an accusation made against her, or her husband would not be pleased with her, or her father would not be pleased with her. In this case, it's better for her not to, to do that, to leave it. But as for making a general rule that wherever you are in the world, if you go to the hairdressers, you're resembling the kafir, then I think that this is something that has no dalil for it. It has no evidence for it. So this is all to do with the hair, uh, as Um Salama said, of gathering the hair together in braids. And uh, there's no harm, obviously, in the woman gathering the hair together uh, in braids. The issue comes as to whether this hadith is specific to the topic of janaba or whether it includes menstruation. And the scholars differed in this matter according to three opinions. Again, it's one of those ones you would expect two opinions, but you actually get three opinions. The first opinion is that this hadith is specific to Janaba. In other words, when she has been intimate with her husband, she doesn't need to take out her braids. When she has, is cleaning herself after her monthly cycle, she needs to take out her braids. And the evidence they use for that are three things, basically. The first, they said that this narration, al hayba is weak. So they said that the, this narration uh, men mentioning the monthly cycle is weak and that the correct wording of this hadith is janaba. And this is something that I believe Ibn Abdul Hadi rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned in Al-Muharrar. Many of the scholars who considered this wording al hayda to be weak. The second thing they used it for is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. Or the second proof they gave is the hadith of Aisha regarding her hajj. So when Aisha went to hajj, she began her monthly cycle. And the Prophet ﷺ said to her, do whatever the hujjaj do, do whatever the people going to hajj do, except don't make tawaf. Obviously not praying and not making tawaf. So Aisha made ghusl at that time. And when she made ghusl, the Prophet ﷺ told her to take the braids out of her hair. However, the, the other side replied back to this and they said that uh, this was not the ghusl she was making at the end of her cycle, but this was a ghusl for cleanliness, general cleanliness. It was a ghusl for ihram. And the ghusl for ihram, it's better that you take your hair out. But they said there's no evidence for taking it out at the end of the monthly cycle because this hadith of Aisha was not specifically a ghusl she made at the end of the monthly cycle. It was a ghusl that she made when going into ihram. So this is one uh, opinion. And the third uh, evidence that they use for this is a logical evidence. They said that ghusl from Janaba might happen many, many times in a month. It might happen 10 times a month, it might happen 20 times a month. As for ghusl from the monthly cycle, it only happens once a month. So the hardship of her taking her hair out every day or every other day is a great hardship. The hardship of her taking her hair out once a month is a very small hardship. So they said that there is no, that that is the reason why she has to take her hair up or she has to loosen her hair. As for the second opinion, the second opinion is that she does not have to undo it for either reason. So she can leave her braids in for 
the monthly cycle and she can lead her, leave her braids in for Janaba. And uh, the evidence they said for this, they said first of all this wording al hayda in the hadith, the menses, and secondly uh, they mentioned the fact that the hadith of Aisha is not specific to ghusl from menses and uh, they said that you know there is no evidence to limit it. And the third opinion, and this was the opinion of narrated by Imam Ahmed in one of the wordings from him and chosen by some of the scholars of Islam, uh, is that it is recommended for her to take them out at the time of uh, menses. They said the evidence to prove that she has to is not strong, but the evidence to prove that it is recommended is uh, reasonable enough. So it's recommended for her to take out her plaits and braids and her tied hair at the time of menses, but it's not required for her to do it at the time of Janaba. In my opinion, and Allah knows best, I think that the safer thing to do is for the lady to take out her braids. And the reason why is it's not a big deal to do it once a month. Um, however, if she has the kind of braids like uh, the style of some of the people from Africa, for example, where they braid their hair very, very tightly and it's very, very difficult to take out, then I, again, you know the evidence, there seems to be a reasonable amount of evidence that she can leave it in. So I think the third opinion might be the stronger one, which is the opinion that it's recommended for her to take it out. But if she cannot take it out for some reason, uh, like for example, uh, if she has had her hair braided in such a very fine way that she's you know, been to the hairdresser and paid a lot of money and a lot of time to get it braided and it's supposed to last three months, then there's no need for her to undo it for uh, menses and Allah which knows best. We now come to hadith number 117. Aisha Rasulullah sallallahu wasallam From Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that she said the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, I do not declare the masjid to be halal for the menstruating woman nor for the person in the state of Janaba. And the meaning of halal here is halal to stay in, i.e. halal to remain in for an extended period of time. And the meaning of this is not that it's not halal for them to come in. So let's deal with what is allowed. Uh, everybody agrees. There are two things everybody agrees on and one thing that everybody disagrees about, okay? The two things that everybody agrees about is that it is permissible for the junub, that is the person in the state of Janaba, and the haid, that is the lady in the state of menses, to enter the masjid for a temporary need and leave. For example, maybe she uh, had left something in the masjid of hers, a bag. So she goes in and she collects the bag and she leaves. Or she has to meet her friend to take her phone number. So she goes upstairs, she takes the phone number of her friend and she leaves. Or the masjid has a door to the east and a door to the west. So she enters from the east and walks up into the masjid and walks out from the door to the, to the west, for example. There is no disagreement about the permissibility of this for the woman and the man. Whether they are in a state of janaba or whether it is for the woman in the state of menses. And the evidence for this is a statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. Ya ayuha ladheena amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun wa la junuban illa abiri sabilin hatta taqtasilu. Allah Azza wa Jal said, O you who believe, do not approach the prayer, i.e. the place of the prayer, while you are drunk, until you know what it is that you say. This was in the beginning before alcohol was made, completely haram. Nor when you are junub, when you're in a state of janaba, unless you are abiri sabil, passing through. Abiri sabil, passing through. So there is no ikhtilaf among the scholars about the permissibility of the woman or the man in janaba or in menses passing through the masjid or going into the masjid for a need. And the evidence of going into the masjid for a need is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha when the Prophet asked her to bring him uh, something from the inside of the masjid in some narrations it was a mat or something to pray on from the inside of the masjid she said oh messenger of Allah I am menstruating he said your blood is not on your hands or your menses are not on your hands and so she went into the masjid and collected it and left there is also no disagreement that the person who is in the state of Janaba is not allowed to sit in the masjid 
because of the ayah. There is no disagreement that the person in the state of Janaba is not allowed to sit in the masjid unless they are passing through. The ikhtilaf comes on the issue of the menstruating woman. Is she allowed to sit in the masjid or not? Why is this ikhtilaf here? Because the textual evidence is for the junub, is for the person in Janaba. The ayah mentions uh, the junub, the one in the state of Janaba. And the ayah doesn't mention the one in the state of menses. So the issue is, is it a valid analogy to compare one to the other or not? We've often said that it's not a good analogy because we've said that menses lasts for somewhere between you know seven and ten days, whereas Janaba lasts for as long as you want as you can, you know, until you go in the shower. So there's definitely a difference between the two. However, we come to this hadith, and if this hadith were be to be authentic, then it would certainly be a clear evidence for the prohibition of the woman sitting in the masjid. However, this hadith is weak. And this hadith is weak for a whole host of reasons. Uh, and we don't really have time to go into too many of them. But there are a number of, uh, a number of weaknesses in it. There are unknown, there's an unknown narrator. There is a narrator who is declared to be weak. Al-Bukhari said about them that they have ajaib, they narrate strange things. Ibn Hazm said, hadith on batil, it is a false hadith. And many, many, many other you know, issues regarding this hadith. Uh, and I think the hadith is not authentic. The hadith is hadith on da'if. So now we come to an issue. We have a weak hadith. We have an ayah that mentions the junub, but doesn't mention the hayat, mentions the one in Janaba, but doesn't mention the menstruating lady. And we have the hadith of Aisha, which in its understanding seems to indicate that you don't go and sit in the masjid because Aisha said, I can't go in the masjid because I'm in the state of menses. And the Prophet ﷺ said, your menses are not on your hands. And that indicates that at least something, it gives us an indication that Aisha understood that you don't go into the masjid. Then you have the fact that the overwhelming majority of the scholars consider that it is haram for the ha'ib to remain in the masjid, for the menstruating lady to remain in the masjid. The reality is, if you are asking, is there a clear dalil, is there a clear evidence to say that this woman should not remain in the masjid, then no, there is not a clear evidence. However, there are lots of little tiny pieces. You know, the ayah says the junub shouldn't sit in the masjid. And there's no doubt that there is a similarity between the two because the two are not, both of them are impure. The hadith says that Aisha said to the Prophet ﷺ she couldn't go into the masjid and the Prophet ﷺ allowed her to go in temporarily. You know, you have this hadith, it's a weak hadith. You have the majority of the scholars, overwhelming majority of the scholars who consider that it's not permissible for her to sit in the masjid. You know, I personally feel that with all of those little fragments of evidence, there is enough to say that she shouldn't sit in the masjid. But having said that, there is not a clear evidence. And I, I agree with our Sheikh, Sheikh Nasir, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, that uh, there is no clear evidence to prevent the woman from this. And there is the hadith of the Musalla, which a lot of the, the scholars use, they say the hadith that uh, uh, as for the menstruating women they avoided the prayer the praying area i mean this is a very weak evidence it's a weak evidence because first of all it's taking place in a musalla and a musalla by consensus is not prohibited for the menstruating woman so there is no evidence in this this is I, okay it's, it's unfair to say there's no evidence but there's very little evidence it's like you're picking little, little pieces of glass, like tiny, tiny little pieces of glass. This hadith is weak. The hadith of Aisha doesn't mention anything. The ayah mentions the junub and doesn't mention the menstruating woman. The hadith of the musalla on the day of Eid is not applicable to the masjid. And there's no way you can compare a musalla to a masjid because by consensus, she can go and sit in the musalla. Because at the end of the day, the musalla is not a masjid by any means or, of the, or, you know, or by any understanding. But... My opinion is, when you take all of these fragments and put them together, 
and you bear in mind that it is the opinion of the overwhelming majority of the scholars and the majority isn't in evidence but it gives that feeling that it shouldn't be done and I think that you can be very purist and you can say look there's no evidence for it there's no evidence here there's no evidence there there's nothing you can hold on to and say this is a strong evidence that she can't sit in the masjid however there's a lot of things which indicate it there's a lot of little pieces which give you an indication that this is the case and bearing in mind that it's likely to cause a lot of upset that the women are likely to become agitated especially those people who hold the opinion of the majority and all of these things together that I think that it's a stronger the stronger opinion is that the menstruating lady should not sit in the masjid and that is because if you take all of these pieces together and put them together you have enough or enough pieces to give some strength to the matter you have enough ahadith enough evidence enough indication and enough scholarly opinion to say that it is better to prohibit the lady having said that can you really go to a lady and say to her that you know if she is sitting in the masjid when she's menstruating that you know you are openly disobeying the command of the Prophet that's a difficult thing to say because there really isn't an authentic hadith in this regard but certainly you would you get the opinion that it shouldn't be done because it, there's just too much in the way of small evidences around the topic that give you enough strength bearing in mind many people consider this hadith to be authentic and there's a lot of you know really I think that when it comes to these issues it's like touching the Mus'haf you know we said there is not a strong evidence for a Muslim touching the Mus'haf only with wudu there is not a strong authentic hadith in this regard it's a very very limited amount of evidence but bearing in mind that there are small pieces of evidence you know this issue of لا يمس القرآن إلا طاهر nobody touches the Quran except one who is pure does it mean spiritual purity does it mean physical purity there's a lot of little little pieces of evidence and there's a lot of scholarly opinion behind it so we say to the people don't touch the Mus'haf without wudu this is the stronger opinion likewise here we don't have one hadith that we say here is a here's an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim that is just going to solve the issue for you but you have a lot of supplementary evidence maybe you could gather 10 or 15 small pieces of evidence from here and there it does give it weight at the end of the day so my recommendation is that the ladies avoid the masjid avoid sitting in the masjid when it comes to uh, the time of their monthly cycle and the reality is they're not you know if, if it's a weekly lesson you're missing one lesson a month maximum two lessons a month the lessons are on YouTube you can catch them up maybe the masjid has an area outside which is true some some masajid do some masajid have a little area outside some masajid she can sit in the car and hear the dust some of the masajid have a room that is kind of on the side of the masjid for the ladies to attend the durus who are uh, on their monthly cycle there's no harm in this but it's better that she doesn't go into the masjid and that she doesn't sit in the masjid during that time because as we said we don't have one like sort of heavyweight evidence we have lots and lots of small pieces of evidence that come together that give us a good strong feeling that it's the right thing to do our next hadith وعنها رضي الله عنها أنها قالت كنت أغتسل أنا ورسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من إناء واحد تختلف أيد تختلف أيدينا فيه من الجنابة متفق عليه وزاد محبان وتلتقي. So Aisha radiallahu anha narrated, I used to make ghusl, me and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from a single vessel. Our hands would take turns in taking the water from it when we were in a state of janaba. And Ibn Hibban added, our hands would meet. So there are a number of issues in this hadith that we have to cover. Uh, the first one is the permissibility of the husband and wife to make ghusl together from a single vessel. So it's permissible for the husband to see the aura of the wife and the wife to see the aura of the husband. And it's permissible for them to bathe together. It's permissible for them to shower together, to take a bath together. The second uh, thing is the humility of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sharing a vessel with his wife to make ghusl from. I mean, a lot of us now, you know, we're not like you know our sort of jug of water or whatever you know we would not like to share it 
But subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ was happy to share the water that he was making ghusl with, with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, which obviously means less water. The third thing we have is the, the economy of water. So using less water when you make ghusl. As we said, the Prophet ﷺ used to make wudu. As we said, uh, that he used to make uh, the, the volume we said would equated to somewhere around about three uh, mud or around about what do we say or do we say two we said it was any around about 750 yeah mud a mud sorry not three mud a mud so it came to around about 750 ml to 500 ml uh, and then we said he would make ghusl with a saw and sometimes a saw and a mud between a saw and between five mud so a mud is according to the stronger opinion a mud is 750 ml and some of the scholars said 500 here the very famous thing they put in the in the wudu areas is 500 but the stronger opinion if you look at the riwayat and the evidence the stronger opinion is that the mud is 750 milliliters approximately but we'll say between 500 and 750 uh, that means that the prophet Sallallahu would make wudu with 500 to 750 mil and he would bathe with a saw to five mud so the maximum that five mud is is 3.75 liters and the smallest that five mud is is two and a half liters so roughly between two and a half and three and a half liters the prophet ﷺ would make uh, would make ghusl with between two and a half and three and a half liters and he would share that with aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her uh, the next issue we have is that the couple sharing the water does not make the water impure does not make the water impure and this is uh, again a strong evidence with regard to what we said regarding the hadith of the qullatain that in the very very beginning of bulugh al-maram that we said that it's not the case that just putting your hand into uh, a vessel in the state of janaba makes the water impure because if that were the case then it would the first person puts their hands in the second person cannot use the water then but here they would put their hands in uh, together so one would put their hand in then the next would put their hand in and the next point is that their hands would touch that their hands would touch and this is an evidence that uh, or this is an evidence uh, that you know that touching does not transfer the janaba from one person to the other it's not like you have to begin the ghusl again it doesn't transfer from one person to the other because they because they their hands touched while they were in the process of making ghusl we then have hadith number 119 as we come towards the end of the chapter. وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن تحت كل شعرة جنابة فاغسل الشعر وأنقو البشر رواه أبو داود والترمذي وضعفه ولأحمد عن عائشة رضي الله عنها نحو وفيه راو مجهول. So this is Two ahadith, hadith of Abu Hurairah, hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa anha. So there are a couple of uh, issues here, a couple of hadith issues. The first thing is every time the Sahabi differs, we consider it to be a separate hadith. And that is why the author has mentioned two hadith with the same wording as number 119 and number 120. Because the principle in hadith is whenever the Sahabi is different, it's considered to be a separate hadith, even if they say the same thing. The second thing that we have here, which is really important, is the word Nahwuhu. Nahwuhu. What is the difference between Mithluhu and Nahwuhu? Uh, this is a very specific word that's used, a very specific word, this word Nahwuhu. And what it means is that the wording of Aisha is not exactly the same word for word as the wording of Abu Hurairah, but it's almost the same. Nahwuhu, something similar to it. And Mithluhu, exactly the same. So if you see that, sometimes this is not well translated in English, but it's there for you in Arabic. Sometimes when you see that so-and-so narrated Mithluhu, and he so-and-so narrated the same hadith, word for word, with the same wording. Someone narrated Nahuhu, maybe one or two words are a little bit different. So something similar was narrated from Aisha and it contains an unknown narrator. So this is from Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda. That the Prophet said, 
indeed under every single hair there is janaba so wash the hair and clean the skin and this is narrated by Abu Dawood or purified skin story by Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and both of them declared it to be weak so this is a weak hadith why did al hafid ibn Hajar include this hadith this weak hadith because remember al hafid ibn Hajar is a great scholar one of the greatest scholars of hadith in the history of Islam why does he include this weak hadith why does he need to include this weak hadith and, and he tells us it's weak he says they both declared it to be weak and then he mentions the narration of Ahmed from Aisha and he says it has an unknown narrator in it and he, both of them are weak he wants to clarify the importance of making sure that the water touches every single place so this hadith as a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, is weak but as a principle is valid meaning as a hadith it's not the Prophet ﷺ did not we cannot say that he said it we cannot say that he said under every hair there is a janabah but there's no doubt that the principle that you have to wash the entire body is exactly the same as wudu if you leave the space of uh, a tiny coin like a 25 you know halal uh, coin or something like that you know just a tiny coin or something a dirham coin or a you know 50 fills coin or something like that 25 fills coin then there's no doubt that if you leave that space in the wudu your wudu is not valid the Prophet ﷺ saw a person with, you know, the, a small, just a small area that he had not washed and he commanded him to go back and repeat the prayer. So there's no doubt to repeat the wudu and repeat the prayer. So there's no doubt that with janaba the water has to cover the entire body. So al Hafid ibn Hajar included this hadith in order to emphasize to us the importance of cleaning every single part of the body in janaba and not you know, a person not being lenient. So making sure that the water goes into the belly button, making sure the water goes under the arms, making sure that the water goes um, underneath the, you know, between the legs and making sure that the water goes between the toes and making sure that the water goes on the heel and goes in the arc of the foot. You know, all of these are, uh, all of these are things that are required from you when making uh, ghusl. But as for the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in under every hair there is janaba, then this is something that is not authentically reported from him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the principle of you needing to cover the entire body with water is one that is, to the best of my knowledge, ijma' upon, there is no ikhtilaf, there is no disagreement among the scholars, that you are required to clean the entire body and that if you leave a space on the body that has not been touched with water then your ghusl is not valid and your prayer your subsequent prayer is also not valid we should also whenever we say that we should also mention the topic of al wiswas it's not for a person to come after ghusl and start saying oh i have a tiny space here i cannot see a droplet of water let me make the ghusl again then this is just wiswas from the shaitan but the person should be careful fear Allah as much as you can they should be careful that they genuinely are cleaning themselves especially in the shower people tend to just you know put their head under the shower you know that they take the shower head from the wall and they use it to clean underneath their arms and to clean in the places where the water maybe doesn't go so that they can be sure that the water has covered all of the parts of the body without going to excess in the water without going to exaggeration without going to excess in the use of the water because again we see some people going to excess and we see you know some people who've been afflicted by things like you know al was from the shaitan and they will say i made ghusl and then i thought about it at the end of the day and i think maybe the tiny spot on the back of my ear i didn't wash it and so i made ghusl again and i repeated all of my prayers then i realized maybe i didn't wash between my little toe so i made ghusl again and repeated all of my prayers this is wiswas from the shaitan but a person should still be careful that they are covering the whole body in water to the best of their ability and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best we're going to continue inshallah because we still have to to cover as much of these ahadith as is as is possible so we continue to a new chapter Babu Tayammum and a Tayammum in the Arabic language is al qast to sort of set out to do something to set out to do something uh, and a tayammum in the Islamic terms or in Islamic terms is to purify yourself 
using uh, earth, clean earth, as a replacement for water, either in replacement of wudu or ghusl, at a time when water is not available or you are unable to use it in a specific, uh, a specific way. So purifying yourself with earth in a specific way at a time when water is not available or you are unable to use it. And that tells us that there are two reasons why you would make tayammu. One is when water is not available at all. And one is when water is available but you can't use that water. And that might be due to a severe illness. It might be you know, due to having a, a wound or something like that that could cause you a severe injury. And there's a lot of things to talk about that what should you do and what shouldn't you do and when should you wipe over and when should you wash and things like that. But tayammum is our topic. So we're just going to cover at least you know, one or two ahadith inshallah so that we can continue on with our, our aim of, of these three pages every single lesson inshallah. وعن جابر بن عبد الله رضي الله عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أعطيت خمسا لم يعطهن أحد قبلي نصرت بالرعب مسيرة شهر وجعلت لي الأرض مسجدا وطهورا فأيما رجل أدركته الصلاة فليصلي وذكر الحديث وفي حديث حذيفة رضي الله عنه عند مسلم وجعلت تربتها لنا طهورا إذا لم نجد الماء وعن علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله عنه عند أحمد وجعل التراب لي طهورا These are the hadith we'll try to cover in this little segment and then if we have any issues left over we can, we can start with the next lesson inshallah. So from Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhuma the messenger of Allah the Prophet sallallahu said I have been given five things no person has been given them i.e. no prophet has been given them before me. Uh, the meaning I've been given five things very important we understand this in Arabic. Whenever you hear something like that I've been given five things Allah has 99 names. It does not mean that these are the only five things or the only 99 names. There are no more than that. The Prophet ﷺ was given many, many more unique things than five. Uh, as Siyuti rahimahullah and others collected entire volumes on the topic of the things that the Prophet ﷺ was given that no other Prophet was given. However, this hadith mentions five particular things so it's very important we understand when it says I was given five things it doesn't mean I was only given five things it means that of all the things I was given I'm going to tell you about five of them the first is I have been given victory through fear to the distance of a month and the meaning of that is victory that over the enemies simply through fear simply through fear and we know about this for example in Surah Al-Hashar uh, when Allah Azza wa Jal said يُخْرِبُونَ بُيُوتَهُمْ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَيْدِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَاعْتَبِرُوا يَا أُولِي الْأَبْصَارِ that Allah Azza wa Jal said that they destroyed their houses and they would buy their hands in the hands of the believers purely from the fear that came from hearing about the, you know, the, the oncoming Muslim army. So the Prophet ﷺ was given victory through the fear that was cast into the hearts of his enemies. And Allah ﷺ mentioned, We put into the hearts of those who disbelieve extreme fear. And this is something that was given to the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, you know, the Prophet ﷺ taking part in battles, there are ahadith which indicate that he was perhaps that he took part in the most in terms of fighting and in terms of battles of any prophet because he said for example ana nabiyul malahim i am the prophet of battles i am the prophet of war i am the prophet of battles and so there's no doubt that the other prophets took part in al jihad fi sabilillah but that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it seems that he this was a particular characteristic of his and one of them that was even more emphatic is that the, the fear would reach a month before the army would reach, the fear would reach. The fear would be struck into the hands of the enemy and they would flee from the sheer fear of hearing of the Prophet ﷺ and the army oncoming. 
and the earth has been made for me as a masjid and a place of purification a masjid and a tahur tahur is something to make purification with remember tahur is the act of purification and tahur is the tahur is the thing that you make it with masjid what does it mean the whole earth has been made as a masjid a place of sajda masjid is a place where you make sujood and that is that a muslim is not bound to pray in for example uh, a place of like the christians for example can only deliver a prayer in the church or the jews can only deliver a prayer in the synagogue or the hindu can only deliver a prayer in the temple whatever one of the unique things that has been given to islam is that there is the entire earth is a masjid for the muslims so they can pray in jama'ah on the sand on the grass on the road in any place and that doesn't mean that we negate that hadith about the importance of the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ said, من سمع النداء فلم يأته فلا صلاة له إلا من عذر. Whoever hears the adhan and doesn't come to it, he has no prayer unless he has an excuse. The sharia is to be taken as a whole. So we take those ahadith that mention the praying in the masjid. But this hadith says, you don't hear the adhan, you can make your congregation anywhere. Even if you want to make a masjid, you can make it anywhere. It doesn't have to be in specific places, in specific churches or temples. It has, it can be made anywhere on the earth. The entire earth has been made a masjid, a place of prostration. And it's been made tahura, and this is the evidence in it. I.e. we can use anything from the earth. Anything from the earth. So this hadith is the most generic. Because it mentions the whole earth can be used for tayammum. And it doesn't mention, for example that just the sand or just the mud or just the soil the whole earth i anything that is naturally from the earth so if it's crumbled stone if it's sand if it's soil if it's mud anything that is naturally from the earth you can't use cement or you can't use you know concrete mix or something like that because it's not naturally from the earth but something that anything that is naturally from the earth you can use as a means of purification in tayammum so whichever man or whichever person it says man here but the meaning is person uh, the time for prayer comes for them let them pray meaning the time for prayer comes you don't have to miss dhuhr because you are 50 kilometers away from the masjid i mean the whole earth is a place of prayer for you and we add to that to the ahadith. So if you hear the adhan, you have to pray in the masjid. And if you, even if you don't hear the adhan, you have to pray in jama'ah and so on and so forth. But the principle that it's not the case that let's say you're 200 kilometers from the nearest masjid, you have to then miss Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib until you reach the masjid. No, you can pray on the side of the road. You can pray on the sand. You can pray on the grass because the whole earth has been made as a masjid. And then he mentioned the hadith with the other virtues. And the hadith of Hudayfa in Sahih Muslim, the turba, any the, the, the earth, the powdered earth, like the soil or the, the soil or the sand from the earth has been made a means of purification if you don't find water. So this benefits us the fact that tayammum is only to be used in one of two circumstances. One is if you can't find water. And the second one is if you are unable to use that water. And uh, this hadith is more specific because it mentions the turba. It doesn't mention the whole earth. It mentions the, you know, the, the soil of the earth or the sand of the earth. And finally, uh, the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib in Ahmad wa Ju'ila at turab the turab. So the sand has been made into a means of purification. But we think that they uh, will cover the mas'ala of what you can make tayammum with next time. Are you allowed to make it with any kind of earth are you allowed to make it what can you and what can't you make it with we'll cover next time but we covered these three ahadith so that we can inshallah move on with uh bab at tayammum and hopefully finish that bi uh next lesson inshallah ta'ala so i think we'll stop there uh once again we remind everybody that since the adhan has gone we should all be praying the salah in this masjid inshallah if anyone needs to go go and make wudu and come back in no problem but we should be praying the salah in the masjid unless somebody has a very very urgent reason to leave but we don't want to have the case that sometimes all of the students get up and leave and, and go you know inshallah if you heard the adhan you should stay in the masjid inshallah unless you have to go and make wudu or unless you have some very very urgent reason to do so and allah azza wa knows best was salat was salam 
على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهدوا أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك